Hello, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sales podcast. This is part two of our conversation with Claire Willett. You should probably listen to part one first. That is in our feed already. And this is the the conversation that happened after the conversation. Um, Liz had to leave us, but Claire and I just kept talking. It does not have an official starting. We just start in the middle of the conversation with Lauren Sarner's uh, special fan fiction. And uh, then we talk about art and the ending of black sales and fandom and all sorts of things. Enjoy. Sail! Do you want to hear Lauren Sarner's theory about about what? I desperately want to hear this. Yes, tell me. <laughs> Um, so Lauren proposed, like, she knows this isn't true, but this is her version that she loves, you know, with the Treasure Island thing. Her version is, uh, sorry, Lauren, if I'm misrepresenting this, I did just listen to it. So I think I'm going to do an okay job is that, you know, Max is running NASA. Of course, Woods Rogers historically does come back. Fuck him, but he does. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then Silver swoops in and saves Max. And it is actually Max, who is the wife in Treasure Island, but it's a partnership of friends who like, you know, of like minds and, you know, they are kind of, they're like a perfect pair in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's like a marriage of convenience and like Mm -hmm. Max has her girlfriends on the side. Silver has his whatever, although he's probably too haunted to actually do romance at that point. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's their life. I, um... A, I love that. Um, I feel. I think I saw. I think I saw on social media people, or maybe it was that I I read, like I read some. Of, I read her recaps, and then there was somebody else at. Uh, uh, there was. I found somebody else whose name I can't now remember, and I feel bad because their recaps were great. But they recapped the whole thing. But I saw kind of kicking around the idea that like um, it was a fan was, theory before Maddie yeah, showed up. It was for mentioned because. Sure. Right. The it was mentions it was, that she's of that she's like a mixed race, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's something that I don't was. Remember. Um, I guess maybe. I feel like like the, the I feel like I remember seeing people talking about about that, but um, but yeah. So I think I mean I I think that's in some ways much more satisfactory. Um, it also I think is a fun little you know foreshadowing of or not foreshadowing, but a little could be a little riff on the scene between uh, Max and grandma Guthrie, which who was just, Oh my God. I know. Right. (laughs) She's so good. (laughs) Um, But, but where she was basically like, you know, you wanted me to find a husband to rule NASA, you know, from sort of behind his back. And I can't promise you that. And that was something else that I liked about the show is that I felt like they, there are so many different ways in which they kind of unpacking the difference between women who accrue power as independent human beings and women whose only route to power is being a wife. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like the like the moment that you really hate was Rogers the most in some ways, like in terms of his relationship with Eleanor is when she has to like you know, when she gets forcibly shoved into the passive wife role in order to sort of retain her position as Rogers' advisor because the other men resent her, you know, like that she kind of has to like do the whisper over the shoulder thing like her grandmother, you know, like that's just like, that's the only route to power available for like well-bred English women and women like Anne and Max and Adele and Maddie and Maddie's mom are able to wield power on their own as individuals. So I think, so there is something that I feel like, you know, but, but like, I think Max can also, Max can do both. Like Max has power on her own and also is really good at sort of strategically moving the wheels and, you know, cranking the gears from behind the scenes to let somebody else kind of be the face of it. So I could see her, I could see her and Silver having an interesting dynamic. Although I, I do yeah, it's it's hard it's hard to imagine. I mean, in some ways, like even more so than Flint, like it's really hard to see any kind of, you know, five years from now, whatever portrait of, of Silver's life that wouldn't be totally fucking miserable. Right. You know, like there's just it's a perfect know, either- it's a perfect tragedy because in yeah. in seeking out love, he has isolated himself completely. Mm-hmm. Like that you see, you know, yeah. and exactly at the halfway point, right? At the halfway point, 
he that's the point where he's like my crew and he mm-hmm. is so ensconced in community and then you watch him basically like what you said with Eleanor like he, he basically turns away person after person after person Mm -hmm. and you have billy as the parallel like billy's the one that's like doing that in the more obvious way and then you see him like literally killing the crew Mm -hmm. but they both have gone down this road of like pushing everyone away from themselves and then those are the two those are the two pirates that will you know be in the beginning of treasure island yeah and and that was something that i was that i was so fascinated by Um, you know, like, like one of the first things that really kind of hooked me into the pilot was, you know, the, like the introduction of, you know, like I'm John Silver, I'm, you know, (laughs) and I'm Billy Bones and you're sort of like, okay, so like, how the hell are you going to become the person that you have to become for any of the things that happen 20 years from now to happen, you know? So like, like when you meet, like Billy's, and Billy's always, you know, suspicious of Flint and, and has, you know, has not drunk the Kool-Aid, like is not convinced by Flint's sort of myth of himself. And, um, but, but he's so loyal to the rest of them and he's loyal to the pirate way of life. And, you know, so, so it feels like there's so many moments where you're like, oh, okay, I could see this being the moment where, you know, Billy breaks with the crew definitively and then he doesn't, you know, and you think he's going to, then he doesn't. And, um, and so watching him get to a point where by the end that he is like, God, that fight scene in the rigging was just... <laughs> magnificent i was like this show has everything uh, but i uh but it sort of felt like it was inevitable that it would have to come to a head-to-head conflict between the two of them you know and that for flint to then you know believe that billy is dead and then billy is not dead like that positions billy to um you know, in 20 years from now to be Billy Connolly hanging out with Gonzo and Rizzo <laughs> at, the, at the Benbow Inn at the beginning of Muppet Treasure Island. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but with Silver, you know, I, I think in Treasure Island, like what we, what we learn from that of, you know, what has happened to him in the intervening years, you know, like it's just, it's just, it's squalor and, and it's depressing and he does end up back in England you know, so he doesn't even end up like keeping his independent free pirate NASA right. life, you know, forever. And um, so it's just, it's a, uh, it's just, it's just grim. And, and it is interesting, like you were saying, like it really is sort of a perfect tragedy, like the, the arc that he goes on from who he is when we, when we meet him to how he ends up. But at the same time, I think the reason why it feels why it feels like this is the only place for the story to end is that like, and again, and, you know, in service of that, that beautiful ambiguity, it's like that we never actually do learn who he was before. You know, the question is asked explicitly and it's never answered. And, um, and that, you know, like that to me, like that, that scene where they're, where they're sword fighting on the cliff, which is just one of my favorite scenes of the whole series. It is so beautiful. And the writing is so wonderful. It's like the piece I was waiting for was, you know, like antagonism between Flint and Silver. Yes. All the way along, off and on at a million different points. But, you know, but what you need to have happen for sort of the kickoff of Treasure Island to make sense is that, you know, is that we hear like that, that we had to watch Flint become afraid of him. You know, like right. the, the saying was always like, like, you know, everybody was afraid of Flint, but Flint was afraid of silver. You know, silver was the only man that Flint ever feared. And that's the piece that you're sort of waiting to see how that's going to happen because that's not really like they annoy each other and they're mad at each other or they're on opposite sides of the line, but that's not the same thing. But then in that moment where, where you see Flint be like, you know, you just told me the same lie again. Like I called you out on it. I I am a clever guy. I can identify these things. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That he's, that it's, that it's like, you know, like it's not, it's not just that he lied to everybody again. It's that when Flint said, Hey, that story didn't quite ring true that he, that he told the same story again, which means that there's, you know, there's active intention behind covering something up. 
that's another area of, of, you know, of ambiguity that I, that I really liked was that, you know, there's, there's an infinite different kind of realm of possibilities of, of who Silver was and the forces that shaped him. And because we don't know that, you know, like maybe if we had a hard and fast answer to that, it would be easier to make a determination as to like which of these choices he made at the end. Um, So I think, again, I think the fact that that's not resolved to me is like a really crucial argument in favor of the fact that we're not supposed to know, you know, like, like we don't really know how silver began and we don't really know how he ended. Right. Well, yeah. and the the thing that's fascinating to me using that line from from Treasure Island is like there's one thing we do know about these two. I mean, we know a bunch of things, but what, though I think the primary thing we know about these two is that Flint loved Silver. Yeah. And so that the, yeah. the idea that the person someone would most fear is the person that they loved. Yeah. Is so terrifying and powerful in in the correct ways for what i see as kind of what black sales is about is that yeah is that human connection is the most important thing and human connection is also the thing most dangerous to us mm-hmm. and which is true which is like yeah true. you know yeah. that is like like is, is there anything more yeah. human ultimately than the fact that human connection is the thing we most fear and then we most crave at the same uh-huh. time um so the i i mean that for me is like you know, you take a child's book that, you know, is a fine child's book, certainly has lasted for a long time in cultural history. But but the idea that like that this fear was actually like this fear sprouted out of love was such an mm-hmm. interesting choice to make because um, oh, yeah. it's just it's very unexpected. It's very unexpected. It's one yeah. of those things that's like completely unexpected. And then the minute you think about it for a second, you're like, Oh no, that's actually completely unexpected and yet com- the most capital T true thing in the world. Yeah, and I no, I totally agree. I I their relationship is so I mean, you're it it's just it's just mesmerizing. I mean, there's 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 so many great characters in the show and there's so many relationships that I love, but it is just I think it's sort of inarguable that it's like the relationship between the two of them and how it evolves. It's like, it is the primary, the primary plot driver of Mm -hmm. the whole show. Like it's, it's the why of why things happen. And, um, and yeah, and it would be, and it would be so easy. And so banal if it was just that they were enemies the whole time, you know, like that's a, where's the where's the new angle in that you know like what is there to unpack in that if it's just like they were like rival captains from different shit or whatever you know but like <laughs> but yeah but the fact but the fact that it's like like that they have that the reason you know, the reason that we're like where, where that fear is born from like the reason that we see flint go to that place you know when they're when they're in that sword fighting scene it's like it's because he's like He's like, but like, I made myself completely vulnerable to you. Like mm-hmm. I, I handed you everything that you could ever need to hurt or disarm or wound me because like, because I thought that's what this was. Like, I thought that's what we were doing with each other. And so like, you know, my whole story, like, you know, everything about me. And, and I, that's, and I, the scene, like, the scene where he tells him that story, like, I think one of the things that's so remarkable about, about the show and about that relationship is just sort of like, you know, I mean, like, like Silver is someone who like, again, sort of like, as, as far as we've seen on screen, is not, is not openly coded queer. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, you know, it's like, it, you know, it's all sort of ambiguous, you know, right. but um <laughs> But it's not, it's not, it's not, just it's not, it's not, not declared in us. any direction. Right? <laughs> right. The way it is with their characters, you know, right. but, but so, you know, so to have, to have that kind of emotional intimacy between a, a queer man and a, you know, as far as we know from what we've seen on the right. screen, not coded queer man, like what other show is doing that? You know, I mean, like, like the, the emotional intimacy between these men is something so 
remarkable to see and and that they're so intentional about like making the choice that like of how silver receives it you know like mm-hmm. that silver has concerns and questions that have about nothing his own, to do about, with the about his own safety people. right <laughs> right right there that that he's he doesn't give a shit that it was a guy he gives a shit that you know every time flint says you're my person something terrible happens to that person. And that's true. Like Mm -hmm. that's something that we have seen happen over and over again. And, um, you know, sort of the, the intensity of, of Flint and his sort of blindness to danger around him leads the people who, who follow him into situations that they can't get out of. And so silver, you know, and Silver puts his finger on it immediately. He he figures out it's like, you know, like people get towed along in Flint's orbit and then they self-destruct and they kind of can't help it. And like, am I going to be the next person that self-destructs? And, you know, because I got towed along by you. And, um, and I just, and I love that so much, both just because it's such a fantastically Silver way to receive this really fraught kind of emotional revelation you know this this thing that no one except miranda has ever known about him like that he right. that he makes part of no, himself no one naked. Who's to, right no one who's well i guess peter ash but like nobody well, else yeah. there in no. their part in that part of the story right he's he's never shared it there are people right. who know it because they were there they were present for it right this is the first time never, he told it yeah he's never trusted somebody enough to be like you know and 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 also to to, I mean, like Peter, Peter Ash knew the facts of what happened and that they had a relationship, but, but Silver knows what it Flint's means. heartbreak. Right. Like Flint, like he knows the emotional, like, like this is what happened and this is how it felt to me. And this is how it changed me. And this is how everything about who I am now is because of that loss. Um, and which is, which is just a really raw thing to allow somebody in and so then you know so then for him to for then to him then so you know so shortly afterwards kind of for flint to sort of realize like oh wait you never reciprocated that like you and not just that you never offered me a story of your own that was that raw but that you you took that like you took that in and and you added it to your arsenal of weapons against me and then you and then you offered me nothing you know right. well and even I even what i asked you like now i'm asking right. you and you're not giving it to me right and i and i'm only noticing this just now because i asked again and you lied again you know so just so that like that sort of those wheels turning like it's very it's chilling and it's also just so deeply deeply sad because it's not just that Flint is like, okay, this level of sociopathic lying is kind of alarming. It's also that it's like, he wants to have that kind of emotional connection with silver too. Like right. he wants, he wants that to be like what their bond is. And, and that's, you know, so I think one of the things, like one of the arguments that I think works very powerfully in favor of, you know, the interpretation that the ending was as we saw it, that he really does take Flint to North Carolina and that that did really play out in real time, I think is, is this idea that, that it is a way that he can give make Flint, amends. Right. Without, give Flint, give Flint what he needs, even though he can't give it to him. That's interesting. Yeah. Like the, yeah, yeah. That he can, well, and, and also that it's like, like the essentially like there's a way for both of us to win, you know, like that there is because, because silver can't silver's not ever going to really be selfless. Like he's never going to, you know, take himself or, you know, or, or Maddie again, cause Maddie's sort of in his bubble mm-hmm. fully out of the equation. But if there is a way to, but you know, but it, like, I, like it was interesting to me that the thing that we see Maddie being really angry about is not, you know, 
okay, you said you didn't shoot Flint, but I completely don't believe you. You absolutely <laughs> shot Flint, you jackass. <laughs> she's angry because she's like, wait a minute. You fucked you up my war. You guy right. to North Carolina and you hatched this whole plan and then you sat on it for what week? Like basically like, so this is how long you've had in your pocket this secret out. You were going to deploy at some point when you needed like, like you would reach a point where you couldn't move the chess pieces around any other way. And this was like, your sort of, this was going to be the sort of way that you went and, and that you basically like, so that's how long you've been planning to totally ruin this thing I've been working for and completely betray me and stab me in the back. So like, so it was interesting to me that it's like, oh, okay. So and like, that actually is something like that actually really does feel very psychologically right for silver. Like, again, I'm telling myself I'm doing a good thing because I'm giving this thing to Flint. I'm giving him a happy ending, but also coincidentally it is, it's the ace in the hole that moves all the chess pieces around so that I can then have the thing that I want. You know, like it's a, it's an, it's a realistically um, like messy way that silver would do a nice thing for someone, <laughs> you know, where it's like, it also just happens to make sure that I come out on top. Um, but it, but it does really feel like, um, you know, like either way, I think, I think whether he did it or whether he spun a beautiful story about doing it, I think again, like the, you know, the sort of the capital T truth, the emotional truth of that is that, is that he deeply, deeply understands the magnitude of Flint's loss and that he wants mm -hmm. Flint not to have lost to that, you know, like right. that he, like there's so much empathy there and there's so much love there and there's so much like, I wish we lived in a different world where none of this had happened. And, and I think that that's a piece of it. That's I think true either way. Even if he killed, even if he killed Flint, he killed Flint. Like you, you know, we've all seen that scene. Like he didn't do it dispassionately. Like whatever yeah. he did, whatever he felt like he needed to do in the moment that we didn't see. Right. Like, so yeah. like we, we don't see the moment where something happened. Mm -hmm. But we see many moments before that. We see a very long, right. elaborate scene before that. And so there is mm -hmm. no question in that scene before that what his emotions are. Like, I don't think when right. he says, I will wait for you, you know, okay, I didn't actually rewatch it today and I lost my ability to totally just quote Black Sails <laughs> off the top of my head, which I used to have. But when he says those words, like, I believe him. I oh, believe yeah. him. I believe him mm -hmm. even if he killed Flint or if he shot Flint in the leg and dragged him mm -hmm. to Georgia. And like whatever version of this mm -hmm. there is, I believe Silver in that moment that he is torn to pieces and mm -hmm. he is making impossible choices. I think both of them are making impossible choices. Yeah. Um, and I never ever doubt how hard this is for him and how much he cares for Flint. Yeah, like it, it feels like it, the, like you can really feel, I think, the frustration, like the frustration on both sides is because it would all be so much easier if I didn't love you, you know, right. like if I, Absolutely. if I had, like, if I didn't give a shit. Right. If you were Ned Lowe, it it's all good. Right. Exactly. I'll just kill you. Exactly. I just kill yeah. you and I stick your head on a pike mm -hmm. and it's all good. <laughs> yeah. And we've seen them both do it. We know that they're both right. capable of it, you know? And, um, and so I, you know, I think like when you watch just like the, you've got the, the acting in that scene, I mean, like they're, they're both extraordinary actors and they're both extraordinary the whole, the whole way through. But like that scene, I think is such a peak for both of them because it's like, like you are watching them both work so hard to try to do this with talking, you know, to try mm -hmm. to do that. Like, like, is there any way that I using all of my powers of oratory can convince you to change your mind, you know? Right. And, um, and in the end, there's just, there just is no way to, you know, to, to do it by talking. Like there just is, they're both just too intransigent, you know, and 
Um, and so, yeah, so either way, so, so whatever that gunshot was that we heard, whether it was Flint dying or whether it was just like incapacitate him and sling him over the shoulder and mm-hmm. stick him in a bag and sail for the Americas, you know, either way, I think it is, um, it's a, it's a, it only happens because, and we have no idea even how, you know, how much time has passed, how long it's been, but, but it's like, these are two men who have exhausted every other option, mm-hmm. you know, and what's really devastating about it is sort of knowing that like, you know, either way, you know, I mean, even, even in a world where, you know, where Flint does get that beautiful happy ending, you know, in, in real time, like it's still like the thing between the two of them is still broken and over, you know, like he could, he could be grateful to silver for, you know, for restoring him to the man that he lost, but still, you know, like, like the, this is one thing that I think. But so he didn't choose it. No matter what, Silver took it. his and Silver took his agency. Right, right. Yeah, there is. Like he's, he's incarcerated. That's a different thing. Also, right. Like Silver I think that's his agency. Like no yeah. matter what, this Silver made the choice of all yeah. the men of all the people in the world. Mm-hmm. Like he took James's agency from him, and the last time James's agency was taken from him was when Thomas was taken from him. Like, I think that like Flint would have, so again, even if he gifted him Thomas back and whatever, like we'll, Mm -hmm. you know, we'll assume some version of happy prison lifestyle, Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) like (laughs) whatever that means, Um, the, their relationship is broken Mm -hmm. because Silver made that choice for Flint. Like, there's yeah. just, I don't like had, if, if we were supposed to see, like you said about how, how intentional they are about when they choose not to have ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Like if they wanted us to say, yes, Flint, like silver convinced Flint and Flint said, awesome, give me my boyfriend back. Like right. we would have seen that. <laughs> right. Like that was, that was something that I like on my, on my sort of list of like, you know, like column A, column B, you know, the, the fact that, the process through which James, you know, goes from being resistant to this idea to accepting the idea is something that we only, you know, we, we hear Silver explaining to Maddie that that's how it happened, but we don't see any of it. Like we don't see him until he's at the gate. Right. And then they have to unbind him. Like he is bound Mm -hmm. until that moment. So yeah, like, like he wasn't choosing to be like, he wasn't well behaved by choice in that boat. He was a prisoner in that boat. Exactly. And, um, and that, you know, I mean, and so that's one of the things where I think like, you know, the, some of the more compelling evidence in favor of, you know, that this is happening in real time is just that like, that as a happy ending, it is still full of uncomfortable, messy details. Like the fact that his hands were bound, like the fact that, that Israel hands is there, which is like, I wouldn't necessarily dream him into my afterlife, you know? Um, And the, and that we see money change hands and the sort of like dubiously shady jailer guy takes sort of a, bag of gold and a bribey kind of, you know, so sort of like, um, like it feels grounded in like, this is how it would happen if this was how it was really happening. Like it isn't, you know, it, it isn't like they free Thomas and Thomas comes to Nassau and they get to be free and happy, you know, like it's not like, right. and say, that was James's still, dream in the, right. in the back, in the, in the flashbacks, James's mm-hmm. dream was you know, that he said to Miranda is the three of us can go live in Nassau and like mm-hmm. live a happy life. Like that was the dream right. version. Like the happy, right. the happy ending we never got was mm-hmm. that the three of them go to Nassau and essentially live like Max and Jack and Anne, like get mm-hmm. to live as a polyamorous family yeah. in a place where these sorts of families are recognized as just as legitimate. And, and that, mm-hmm. that's the happy ending. Like there's, yeah. There's no version of this ending, nor, I mean, nor, nor no matter how much everyone says, like if they've watched Black Sales for, you know, 37 episodes, like there's no way you can expect that the 38th episode would somehow be like all lollipops and rainbows. Right, right, right. Like lollipops and rainbows is not one of our options. Mm -hmm. It's always going to be bittersweet. 
So like right. no matter which version of the ending and how you see the ratios of bitter and sweet in mm-hmm. those different endings, bittersweet's the best you're going to get. Exactly. Yeah. And I, and I think that that, um, to me, I think, I think the reason, the reason why, you know, the, the bitter and the sweet, you know, doesn't like as a queer viewer, it, not just that it doesn't bother me, but I, but that it feels narratively satisfactory to me is that, you know, again, like this isn't like, these aren't the only queer characters. There's a whole bunch of different queer characters whose storylines go in lots of different directions. So, you know, so even if like, even if we do say like, you know, like even if Silver did shoot Flint on that island, you know, and Thomas did die in the shitty homophobe mental hospital, Max is alive and thriving, Anne is alive and thriving. Like they didn't, you know, like there's still, it's not like the representation that this show provided was only one character or only one relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, It opens up space for them to do lots of different things with lots of different characters because you're not, you know, a queer audience is not like, the only person on the screen who looks like me or shares this, this life experience with me is like that one lesbian and you shot her, you know, like, it's not like that. And um, so, so I think that intentional and careful writing of all these characters and their relationships all the way along the line is how you can sort of get to the end and be like, you know what? I feel like, you know, like, even if, even if the way that it ended was, that like you said like that the reunion is happening in the afterlife like the reason that it is still emotionally satisfying to me is because what I wanted and needed from that story was for the love that these two men had to be deeply deeply central to the narrative and so the fact that that's where it ends makes it clear that either direction you know, whatever happened, that it unequivocally was like that it was it was the like the, the force that shaped NASA in in so many ways, like the force that that shaped how huge world events played out, you know, among all these different people and all these different countries and parties, you know, traces back to this moment of of like these two men and this love that they have that they're being told is forbidden and wrong and, and, and that they get to, you know, that in the end they get to overcome that and have some kind of a future together again, like whether it's, whether they're, you know, alive in the afterlife or alive in the American South, you know, either way. But so I think, so to me, it felt like, like that's, it's satisfying either way because I just wanted them to get back to each other. Like I just wanted us Mm -hmm. to get that moment of, you know, them finally getting the thing that they weren't allowed to have for so long and to know that they're not going to be separated again, you know? Well, and Liz brought up in our finale episode, like that, that Thomas is wearing all white and Flint is wearing all dark colors. And so there is this like, there's just this visual sense that these two are two halves of a whole mm-hmm. and that, that again, however you see the ending, that is true. Like yeah. they, they were always meant to somehow find their other half again. Yeah. However that ends up happening. I mean, for me personally, again, the, the, the Greek mythology specifically also in addition to giving them the reunion also honors the fact of their heroism. Like that there was yeah. this sense that like that they were so heroic that they actually got to have this special space in mm-hmm. the afterlife that is, you know, that is not just for normal people, that that, that, yeah. that they transcend that as well. Yeah. Um, but again, I like, I personally love to play with all of the endings, even the really yeah. scary ones, <laughs> just to like <laughs> see where no, they I mean, I- See yeah. where my emotions go when mm-hmm. I, when I play with them. Cause that's what's, I think ultimately like, like ultimately I see now that I've seen a well done amb- ambiguous ending, I feel like there've been a lot of less successful ones in the history of television. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, because, because often, I mean, sometimes when we say ambiguous, what we mean is the writers left things really messy. Yeah. And this is not messy. This is extremely precise and strategic. I mean, down to like, 
like the lighting, you know, like the washed mm-hmm. out lighting where you're like, okay, well, this is, this is the dead Miranda lighting, but it's also the America flashback lighting. So which, you know, so like, but I meant to understand that this is in some way kind of like, is it maybe happening out of time because it didn't happen or is it happening out of time because it's like a flashback and you know, like, like that I'm, but it's an intentional lighting choice either way, you know, like it's a, it's a visual, you know, decision that's being made. So I, I think it's, it's a really precisely constructed kind of ambiguity. And I think a lot of times with, you know, with other shows or with other, you know, movies or, or writing, you know, or where sometimes you can, you know, somebody will say like, well, we left that really ambiguous. And it's like, well, no, I mean, like, Yes, but it's you, because you just like, didn't really end it. <laughs> right, you did, yeah, like either either like you didn't pick a lane, or you didn't want either side of the fandom to yell at you, so you just didn't resolve it, or you know, or you or you couldn't figure out a way to, you know, wrap something up. So you were just sort of like the ending is just not an ending. We just you know, I, I, so it's just you know, it's one of those things where. It's very easy, I think, for a lazy writer to hide behind, you know, well, it's just ambiguous as a way to sort of camouflage. Like you can paper over a lot of half-assery that way. And I think, but so I do think, you know, I feel the, you know, the same way that you do. Like when, when something is, um, when something is left ambiguous with such intention, you know, Mm -hmm. like, like where you're like, okay, well, you know, there's, there's this thing over here, which seems to indicate this, but then there's this other thing that seems to indicate the exact opposite. And they're both true. And they're both extremely precise as to why they're in there, you know? Um, and they happen I, to hand you right before that, a line about seeing two space, two points in space. Right. One time. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then follow it up with Rackham being like, why does it even matter? You know, like maybe he's dead. Maybe he's not dead. That's not the point, you know? And like the only thing that really matters about a story is whether it's a good story, you know, like that. Um, I mean, t- to me, that feels like, you know, Rackham is telling us how to read what just happened, which is, which is like in some ways, like on a meta level, it's like the most important thing is, did you like the story? Right. You know, did you like the story of these men and their relationship and this show and this world? And so if you did, then it's a good ending. And and whether Flint ended up, you know, leaving the island or never leaving the island or whatever happened is sort of immaterial in that kind of big picture sense, because it's just sort of like... You know, about what is true for you. Yeah. Um, So I love that. Yeah. I mean, this is what, um, you know, I've had lately in a lot of conversations is like the thing that's interesting about the lowercase true versus the uppercase true is that these things are also um, malleable. Like we change with time. Right. Right. We change with time. And this is how we interact with art. I mean, this is why it's, you know, Mm -hmm totally hilarious and also completely appropriate that like Rackham full on goes into talking about what art means at the very end yeah. because yes. it's like yeah. ultimately that is what this is this is where a show like Black Sails transcends to use Rackham's word um from just like plain old television to art because yeah. because if it's television we watch it and we and we're like that was fun And then you like move on to the next thing. And a show like Black Sails is one that you could watch 10 years from now and you're going to be a completely different person than you were 10 years ago, which means you're going to actually interact with it differently. And all of these openings that the, that the creators left for you are actually, um, roots of exploration for yourself because ultimately it isn't what they intended it isn't what you know again your tally lists like the tally lists i agree like quite Uh, equal very well constructed but ultimately it's not about that ultimately it's about how it makes you feel and Mm -hmm. why do you prefer like what makes you prefer like we talked about that for both of us like what Mm -hmm. makes you prefer to see the ending the way you do 
And that mm-hmm. can change over time. Like you can yeah. have new feelings about that, that relate to God knows what happened in your life or my life 10 mm-hmm. years from now that will make us see the ending and go, oh shit. Like suddenly this version of it is more meaningful to me than the other right. version. And that's the beauty. Like that's, yeah. that's ultimately what makes this truly a valuable experience mm-hmm. is that it, that it shows us who we are. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. And I think that that is, you know, something that I've been been very interested in sort of exploring, you know, over the course of my, you know, my lifetime, I'm 39 years old, just like, you know, like, re- like rereading a book as an adult that I loved when I was 14. Isn't that the best and, experience? And feeling all of the way that things sort of land differently or, um, you know, or, or, um, you know, or watch, like I'm, I'm rewatching, um, uh, Star Trek Voyager and Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which are two of my like favorite, favorite shows as a young person. And looking at like, you know, like when I was, like when I was 11, you know, who's the character that was the one that I like identified with the most. And like, now that I'm almost 40, is that different? And, mm-hmm. and, and again, like, and, and one is not more true than the other. It's just that like who I was then and what I got hooked into in the fiction that I consumed was different than than it is now. And and so that's, so that's why I think it, you know, it makes sense to me, like why, you know, like why people in the fandom who were like very definitively, like, you know, this is the ending. This is the way that it ended. There's only this one interpretation. This is, you know, like, this is what I needed it to be. And this is what it is. Like, I totally get that because I feel like, to me, it's like, what that means is like, you know, like, like you as a person, you're at a place in your life, you know, you, you're the way the other media that you've consumed and what you need the story to be and what you need for it to give you and, and what hooks you into it is very centered on the need to interpret this ending in a particular way. And that's totally fine. And maybe 20 years from now, you'll come back to it and you'll feel the same way. And maybe you'll feel totally different, but it's just sort of like, it's just, it's always just sort of a reflection of who we are at a moment in time. And I think sometimes when we're younger, we're sort of more black and white and we get older and we're sort of like, I think, you know, there's more capacity sometimes for nuance, but it is also very much like, you know, the media that we consume and the stories that are compelling to us, you know, are like, they're just all different ways for us to understand ourselves. You know, I, I know things about 14 year old Claire that Jane Eyre was my favorite book and I was obsessed with Mr. Rochester (laughs) and I know things about 39 year old. We can have a whole different conversation about that. (laughs) Well, and then, you know, and then, but I know things about like adult me where I read that now and I'm like, Oh my God, that relationship is so messed up, you know? And it's just like, and what isn't like, it doesn't mean that I was wrong. It just means that who you I was a different place. and what I right. wanted out of the narrative then was like, you know, this like, Hey, 14 year old me thought it was actually a story about Jane and Rochester. And then mm-hmm. Liz and I covered it like, I don't know, like probably a year and a half ago. And I was like, I had not reread it in so long. And I was like, holy shit, he's a minor character in this. Like this is a hundred percent her story. And he's mm-hmm. just like one of three guys that she interacts with. Yeah. She leaves for like 300 pages to <laughs> right. go be in and a whole different story. Right. Yeah. And she's not with him for like 300 pages. It's just like, he's one third, he's literally yeah. one third of the book. And I was just yeah. like, that blew my mind because it's same. like teenage mm-hmm. me was like, Oh, Jane and Rochester. And then like adult right. me is like, whatever, Jane. You're like, Oh, this isn't really a romance. Yeah. No, not a romance. Yeah. It's- you're like, this is, this book is like a, a portrait of this woman's interior life in which this guy comes in and out of it. But yeah, but that, but it is, but it, but it's like, but that's like at different phases in our life and our identity and, and how we sort of grow and learn and change and develop and consume other media, you know, that, that evolves really differently. I was, I was on a podcast earlier this year um, called fuck boys of literature, which. Um, oh, I love that podcast. Uh, oh yeah. I need, so find, I, was, so, I need to find your episode. That's so awesome. I, so I did Rebecca. So I came on to talk uh-huh. about Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, which was another one of my favorite books when I was like 12 or 13 years old. And it's a very similar, like, um, you know, young me thought it was this like 
super angsty, dramatic, dreamy, romantic, like, oh my God, these people, they're so in love and this world is so screwed up. But like, the, you know, and you read it now and you're like, oh, this is a horror story about a disaster marriage. Like, I didn't know that when I was 14. I was like, it's so romantic that they are willing to like commit murder for each other or whatever. You know? um, <laughs> And then you watch it now and you're like, oh, everyone in this book's a horrible person. But again, like I, but it's because this was the first time I had reread it since I was older than the heroine. And so that, which totally changes the story, you know? So, so it's just one of those things where I, I enjoy that ambiguity because I like, I like learning new things about myself and I like thinking about the ways that, um, the ways that people, receive narrative really differently just sort of based on who they are like when I when I used to do my my the hundred podcast my friend Erin so she's a I'm a playwright and she's an English professor um which just means just right off the bat we have super different ways of interpreting text sometimes and we agreed on a lot like most of the time if I like something she also liked it if she hated something I also hated like we were usually pretty in sync on our opinions but there was one point where we hit a roadblock where there was a scene that I absolutely loved and she could not stand it. And we were like, Ooh, this is really interesting. Like we've, we've never disagreed this forcibly before. And so we did like a whole hour long podcast segment just on like, can we pick apart the reasons why our perspectives on this relatively small kind of character moment were so opposite. And what we sort of landed on was because you know, she's a, she's a literary analyst. And so for Mm -hmm. her, it's like, it needs to be on the page. It needs to be in the text. Like, I don't buy this relationship, you know, unless things have been said out loud and I'm a playwright and I'm like, well, the relationship is in the eye contact and in the spaces between the lines and in the performance. And, you know, so like, that's how I interpret text. Which scene is this? It was in, I think it was in season four. You might have seen it. It was like, it was Cain and Bellamy, um, which was one of my favorite relationships though, before the, the show ceased to care about it. But but when it when it was a thing that the show gave a shit about, it was one of my favorites. And and so I think it was the line where he, where he's telling Bellamy, like, you, you know, turn the page and don't look back. And they're like leaving town. So it's sort of a paternal thing. And so Erin, who, who really, she and she loved, um, like Bellamy was one of her favorite characters and Kane was one of my favorite characters. And so together we loved it when they were together on screen. Um, and, but she was like, wait a minute, like he has not, Kane has not earned like the, the right to make that sort of definitively kind of paternal of a statement to Bellamy based on the nature of like the interactions that they have had before sort of previously like they just like they she she was like I don't feel like they're at a place in their relationship where that's something that Bellamy would receive from him and I and and so we sort of and we we kind of looked at like dialogue wise I think that's true um for me where I felt like that absolutely felt you know earned and and real to me was it's like well if you're thinking about things like you know, in the scene in Polis when Cain is chipped and you're looking at the anguish on his face when he realizes how much he hurt this person or the moment where they're making eye contact with each other through the windshield of the car when he's trying to, like, drive away with Pike, but he can't run over Bell. So, the, so to me, right. it's like there's all of these silent moments of eye contact and emotional connection between these two men that, to me, as a person who... Like I'm, I'm a playwright. That's like, I, I write to leave space for actors to make those choices. And to me, I'm like, okay, I think those actors have made choices that to me is like, they're playing this relationship. Like there's a father son emotional connection between these two men. So when this overtly kind of father son advice moment things happens, I am totally prepped to buy it and Aaron was like it's not in the text you know and and again it's like it's like one's not wrong it's just everything about how I interpret this scene just based on who I am as a person because I write for the stage you know versus everything about how she interprets text because she is a person whose job is breaking down how a writer on a page constructs 
like in that emotional moment, we just, we just dissect things totally differently and we're looking for different things. Um, I mean, so there is really also cool. space for personal stuff too, is like, the exactly, just, exactly, it's just like, yeah. it's just like you may, you may, you know, like father son dynamic may just plug into your receptors better and exactly and that's that's what it is for you know for for me too like we it's also very freudian we also have totally different relationships with her dads you know like she does not have a relationship with her dad and my dad and i are very close and so some of it is also just as as straightforward as that and um and also that like i write a lot of fanfic and kane and, and abby were my favorites and so i wrote a lot of like i i lived a lot in a fanfic world of like this father son like this relationship between these two men being emotionally important in like a lot of different Mm -hmm. ways so um so you know so again and that's something else i think is interesting too and and something that i wonder you know in terms of shaping to sort of you know circle back to the ambiguity of um, of how the show ended part of me also wonders like another place where i could see a, a discrepancy between how person A and person B interpret that ending is like, what's, what does fanfic world say? You know, because, because mm-hmm. there are head cannons or there are sort of things that like, that, you know, you don't quite know, like, where did this idea come from? But like everyone in the fandom sort of like, just sort of agreed one day that this thing is how this thing works. And so it's sort of a thing that just kind of weaves itself through all the fic or whatever. And so you receive those things and you absorb them as though they're part of the story because they're part of what the story is for you. They're just threads coming in from different places. And some of it's what's in your head and who you are in your own mind. Some of it's what's on the screen. Some of it is things like how the actors or the writers talk about things. Some of it's fanfic or fan art. Some of it is the conversations that you have with your friends and all those different little threads kind of coalesce. And that shapes how you view what happens on the screen next. And so I feel like, you know, that's just, it's just another way of sort of reflecting like that we're all sort of bringing many different pieces of our identity to the screen when we're watching something. And, you know, and that's why like what seems super obvious and straightforward to you might look completely differently from somebody else who's coming at it from a totally different point of view. So I just, and I just think that shit's really interesting and I love talking about it. It is. It is. It is fascinating. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting in the course of the podcast. Like Liz and I were, um, you know, we were just two people. We were two people who often disagreed about the text, which was really fun for us. Like we come from very different backgrounds. Um, so like that was that was a really fun thing for us um, as just as a pair. It wasn't something that it wasn't something that we put a lot of thought into ahead of time. We were just internet friends who decided to do a podcast together so it wasn't like like oh let's construct a podcast pairing of these two people from very different backgrounds but um but it turned out to be really interesting um and certainly not representative of all of the fandom because the black cells fandom is vast i mean that's that's also Mm -hmm. something that's really was fascinating for me um near the finale and i've talked about this before like in addition to whatever fear I acquired about talking about the ending, there was the beauty of, of the fact that we, we became the receptacle of um, how people responded to, especially Flint's speech, like just how much it touched so many people in so many ways, like people just from every walk of life imaginable, but people, but, I mean, that was, and it was something, I don't know if John said this on the, on the podcast or said this to me separately, but like, you know, that everyone has some experience in which they have been an outsider. Yeah. That speech speaks to everyone on some level. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what's fascinating is like that, that, I mean, that's, what's fascinating for me about the speech. That's what's fascinating for me about Flint's story, even though, Mm -hmm whatever number of years later, like it's actually Silver's story that has been the one that has haunted me and occupied the most of my brain mm-hmm. time. But what's fascinating about Flint's story is he is, he's a man who was personally wronged in a structural way, but like that he went from experiencing a wrong that, that for him was personal and that we watch the process of him un- starting to understand 
how that connects to the ways other people are wronged until yeah. we get to that speech where in fact he's not just talking about the wronged he's actually also talking about the people who live within civilization the people who are not the outsiders and how this is actually affecting them as well and that's what's yes. fascinating to me about it is like watching watching a man who was subjugated because he was gay actually realize how that connects to the subjugation of other people yeah i think i think you're so right i think that's i mean the show like that speech but also the show as a whole it's like it's such a magnificent love letter to misfits and also such a really searing indictment of conformity and of institutions that demand conformity and of and of the things that are praised as being civilized that when you scratch at the surface even a little bit are revealed to be like that's what's really barbaric you know like those are the monsters yeah it's this like magnificent inversion of you know like of 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 starting from like taking everything that you think that you know about pirates everything that you think that you know about captain flint and long john silver and these sort of childhood villain and blackbeard myths, you know and black be a blackbeard yeah and then what gets unpacked for you over the course of the show is the realization that like that those myths were created for it like it it, like it makes you wonder like were those myths created for you intentionally because it benefited somebody else for you to believe that these guys were the outcasts and and so then when flint makes that textual like when flint says like here's what's going to happen you and me are going to be the bad guys in a famous english children's book that's going to shape how everybody thinks and talks about pirates for the rest of western civilization that's what like that's what you're about to do here and so and silver makes choices you're to about anyway, to become like, a tool of other people's right. subjugation right and and so conformity is going to be enforced you know like like codes of behavior are going to be you know like leveled against people and you know and their obedience demanded because you are like the monster that lives under their children's bed Exactly. You know, and, and so, so I think, I think that is like, like even, you know, even if Flint was not a canon queer character and even if Flint's relationship with Thomas was never made textual or never, you know, or not centered as profoundly as it was, like, that's still like to, like to me, like that would still be a story that queer audiences would latch onto and be like, yes. That is us. That is me. That is who we are. You know, I, I think, well, like, like you and I were talking about today on Twitter, like I was co-facilitating a writing workshop for queer people this morning. Oh, right. And, I, I meant to bring that up. <laughs> yeah. And one of the, I, I forgot about it because I got so distracted by all the millions of other things that we were talking about, but, but yeah, but so one of the prompts that I gave to the, the writers in my group was uh to do a free write on you know like write a, write a queer love story that doesn't end in tragedy and what was really interesting was you know was that all of them said like that was like that was the hardest prompt of the whole weekend and it's because we consume these tropes about what it means to be queer, how queer people deserve to be treated, whether you're worthy of love or not, whether happy endings are possible for you or not, whether you're interesting people to tell stories about, whether straight people give a shit what happens to you. We consume all of these things from all the media all around us. And then we sort of just go like, well, okay, I, I, I guess I'm sort of at best a wacky supporting character in some straight woman's rom-com and that's my life, you know? Um, and and so even for ourselves, like even in a room where everybody was queer and it's a year long queer writing workshop for queer people to unpack queerness. And, and it's like even, you know, it's the safest imaginable space getting out of their heads like, oh, we're allowed to have stories, you know, where we went. And I, and I was very clear. I was like, it doesn't have to be a happy ending. Like just or right. like just a moment of queer joy. <laughs> Exactly. Like, well, the, like, like, like that's, that's actually allowed. <laughs> right. Well, and that's what that's what I told them was I was like, this does not mean the story has to have 
a happy ending. It like like it can be a story about people who fall in love and then break up, but then they go on to be fine and have fine lives. Like that's still a queer story that doesn't end in tragedy. Like it like it's just you know, like it doesn't need to be necessarily like a fluffy Hallmark Christmas movie. Like it could be, you know, a story that has weight and and heft and angst and characters suffer and go through things, but but it centers the primacy of their relationship. Like you know, it doesn't have to be like happy is you know like sort of right. a moving target, um, but just anything that doesn't end in like a tragic ending that is sort of punishing these characters for being gay. Like it was just, it was really difficult for a couple of the, of the writers to sort of, to really push through that. And, um, and they struggle with it. And I, and I, I found it really interesting and also, I mean, like deeply heartbreaking. And I, so I was tweeting about it and a lot of people were like, well, that, that's so surprising. Cause like, I would think, like, I think that they would be so excited. Like, I think that they would be, like hyped to be able to like tell a story that's different from the stories that we sort of consume about the world. And it's like, yeah, but like if you live in like Twitter fandom land where like fan fiction and like YA and sci-fi and fantasy and, and all of these genres are becoming more and more queer inclusive, you know, and also you're a younger person. And so you're just more ferociously demanding and expecting of that as just like, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to want to see in your media. You know, like these were people that were in their forties and, um, and it's just like the world is totally different. So it's like, if you're just coming out, like if you're a playwright and you're coming at this from the point of view of like what you see on stage of, you know, queer people in the theater or in movies or whatever, it's like, you know, it can be hard to imagine yourself into a story that ends well. And that's what I, why I, I like so much the, the way that Max and Anne end is that it's like, it doesn't need to be like, you know, the three of them stay together as a throuple and are having great hot sex all the time. And they're still super in love and it's happily ever after. Like, it doesn't need to be like, like they've, they found a balance that works. We don't need to necessarily know what that balance looks like. That's also, that is also a level of ambi- ambiguity. Like we don't exactly. know who's yeah. having sex with whom. Right. Like we right. know that those three are probably like, it feels like they're probably family to each other still. Yes. And we yes. don't know and who's having sex with whom. Exactly. If we know who's that. having sex with who. Yeah. But, but we know that they're for the moment as how the story is ending, that they're all going to be okay. Right. You know, like we don't know what happens 10 years from now. We don't know, you know, whatever, but like, it's a, it's an ending that isn't tragedy because you're like, you know, they like the two queer women get to end this show in the place that they the most want to be. Like Anne is sailing off on a ship with Jack and Max is running NASA. And these are the things that they wanted and that they fought for this whole time. And they got them. And they're like alive and successful and they have their people and they're going to be okay. And like, and that to me, like, that's a queer happy ending. Yep. You know, like the gays got to win. I think that's wonderful. And, you know, so I, I think it is just like it, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like when I watch so many shows, like I'm, I'm expected to like, you know, send a muffin basket and a thank you note because they gave a lesbian five lines in one episode. And it's just like, that's the shit that we're all tired of, you know, like, like swallowing bare minimum representation or really destructive representation, you know, like really ugly or violent or stereotype, you know, tropes and being expected to say thank you because it's like, better than nothing and there was even less than this 10 years ago so just swallow it so i so i get that that feeling of anger and frustration and that feeling of latching on to like i need this to be the one story where it's like all the gays got to win and if that's the place if that's sort of the place that you're standing in when you're watching this finale then you've got that that, then you've got that right and and you and you need to be in a world where james and thomas get to like, you know, have the happy ending that they were denied in England, then I'm like, yeah, I'm there with you. Like, I, you know, like I also get it, you know, and, and so it's just like, it's just one of those things where I, I just feel like the right or wrong is, is less important to me than, you know, like than we've been talking about, like, what is, what is the thing 
that nurtures you in this story and and what is the thing that you need to sort of hold on to and um and and where do you where do you see yourself in it you know like if the character that you place yourself in like if you relate to um you know thomas is the character that you emotionally graft onto it, it is i can see like it's profoundly important to be able to believe in a world where you know he is if not happy because he's still a prisoner at least content and alive and well and healthy and unharmed and that eventually after you know 10 years he'll get his lover back um as opposed to that he was betrayed by his dad and his friends and died alone in an absolute nightmare of a you know asylum prison like that's like a hundred percent. Yes. Hold on to that. Live in that world. You know, um, it, it isn't not true. There's, there's no, there's no proof that it, you know, like it's not, that's not a wrong interpretation. The show, right. It's the show is like 100% there with you. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think it's just, but I, but I do think, I think telling somebody else the way that you see it is quote unquote wrong because, uh, because it, I presume that the place where I am standing is somehow objective in a way that the place where you are standing is not. And so I see a thing that you don't see. So I'm wrong in like, I I'm right and you're wrong. Like, like that, that I think is, I don't, I don't know who that helps. Although I definitely feel like I like, you know, I get that impulse, but it, but it does feel to me like in this case with this show and this finale, I think in some ways the the worst thing that you could do would be to say the place where I am standing as I watch this moment play out is the only place that there is to stand, you know, is the only point of view, the only angle into this story. Because I think the whole point of it is that it's like there's 360 degrees worth of places to stand and look into this story. And everyone is coming at it from a slightly different place. And so it's just sort of like, it's a way we can understand each other better in a lot right. of ways. Well, and it was built to encompass that, which is what's, yeah. what is most fascinating about it is that yes. it is actually built somehow magically built to encompass all of those points of view and still be sturdy. Yeah. Which is a feat. Yeah. Which is a feat. <laughs> like, yeah, it, like I'm a writer. That shit's hard. Ending <laughs> things is hard and ending them well is hard. And on some level, it's like, I mean, you're never going to write an ending that makes everybody happy. Um, but I think you're never going to write it. You're never going to write a show that makes it. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. You're never going to do anything with your life as a human being. You're never going to, never going to host a podcast um, that makes everyone happy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, word. But I do, you know, but I do feel like, you know, if you write an ending that makes everybody think and that makes everybody feel something right and and give people something. an emotional Amazing. experience then like like then then that in and of itself i think is a profound achievement and i've watched a lot of shows that have you know like like run much longer than four seasons you know where i have you know gotten to the end and i've been like this doesn't you know like this doesn't give me anything like i'm not I didn't learn anything new or interesting about myself. I didn't have an emotional experience or I didn't feel like the characters that I loved were loved by the writers the way they were loved by the fans. And that's something I think is also so important about this too, is it's like what, again, like whether they're alive or in the afterlife or whatever, like the show loves those men so much and loves their relationship so much. And the actors love that relationship so much that it's like, that is also really profound because, you know, because that's like, that's also sort of rare, you know, like the, a lot of times, you know, like there've been lots of shows that I have enjoyed, but have felt turned off by because it's just sort of like, I don't actually feel like the writers or people that are involved in making this show like care about it as much as we do. <laughs> like, and it's fine if you're just sort of like, I go to work and this is my job. I make television and then I go home. Like, that's fine. Like, it doesn't make you a bad person. Though. Like, that's like a way to live. Um, but the whole nature of fandom is that you develop these incredibly deep emotional relationships right. with these characters and these, and these people and their stories. And so it is sometimes kind of like, oh, you just like, this is, this is, 
like this is awakening something emotional in me that I was hoping was going to be reciprocated by the people who made the show and it wasn't and that feels like kind of a letdown or like I like a, a bummer for me that I don't have that and I and I feel like with this show it's like you know like the like three and a half years after the finale the actors are still liking tweets about you know, like it's just like they're yeah, they still are. they're still invested in it you know like it still means something to them and that's something I think is really profound too you know like that's something really impactful and just I mean and the fact that like and you guys are still making this podcast like that there's still there's still hunger to keep having these conversations and having you know cast interviews and discussions and all of this stuff years after the fact because because we're not done mining everything there is to be mined in this narrative like that's also really profound I think I agree Claire thank you so much for joining us Tell us, tell like, tell listeners where they can find you on the internet. Even though I stalked you, they may not know where to find you. <laughs> um, I am, I'm many places on the internet. I, um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Claire Willett, C-L-A-I-R-E-W-I-L-L-E-T-T. Um, that's my main account for yelling about things and live tweeting things. Um, I also have a separate Twitter that is at Claire Trek where I'm just live tweeting Star Trek. Um, cause that's just who I am as a person. Um, I also wrote a science fiction time travel book called the rewind files. Um, say, uh, mom, daughter, time travel adventure about Watergate. And you can find that on Amazon and in anywhere else you can buy eBooks, I believe. Um, and yeah. And that is, that is it. I believe that is me on the internet as a person. It has been such a pleasure to have you on. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. I, I've really enjoyed listening to your podcast and I've just really been just so delighted by just how much I enjoy the show. And also by just the fact that so many interesting conversations about this show continue to be happening. So I think that's just, I think this is it's something really special. So I'm I am thrilled to have been invited and get to be a tiny little part of that. Thank you so much. Yay. Yay. Steve is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash common room radio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag fathoms deep and follow us on Twitter at black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at common with fathoms deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening.